This video is about rates of change in linear and quadratic functions. This is AP Precalculus Topic 1.3. If you appreciate this content, please give it a like. For a linear function, the average rate of change over any length input value interval is a constant, and we often think of this as the slope of the line. Example 1. The table above gives selected values of the function f of x. Explain why f of x is not a linear function. On the interval from a to b, the average rate of change of f of x is f at b minus f at a over b minus a. In other words, y minus y over x minus x. If f of x is a linear function, then the rate of change should be constant for any interval. On a table, we show the b minus a like this. 2 minus 1 is 1. And then 4 minus 2 is 2. 8 minus 4 is 4. So these are the values of b minus a for each interval. Similarly, on a table, we like to show the f at b minus f at a part like this. 7 minus 4 is 3, 10 minus 7 is 3, and 13 minus 10 is 3. So these are the values of f at b minus f at a for each interval. Now we can record the rate of change for each interval. It's going to be the change in y divided by the change in x. So in this case that will be 3 divided by 1, which is 3. For the next interval, that will be 3 over 2. And then for the third interval, that will be 3 over 4. We know that f of x is not linear because the rate of change is not constant. If f of x had been linear, each of these numbers would be the same. Example 2. Consider the quadratic function g of x equals x squared. Complete the table of values for g of x over consecutive equal length input value intervals below. Then complete the table for the average rates of change of g of x for each consecutive interval of equal length input values. g of x is x squared, so negative 3 squared is 9, negative 1 squared is 1, 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, and 5 squared is 25. Now let's calculate the average rate of change on the interval from negative 3 to negative 1. The change in the output values is negative 8. The change in the input values is positive 2. The average rate of change is the change in the output value divided by the change in the input value. So negative 8 divided by 2, which is negative 4. What about the interval from negative 1 to 1? The change in the output values is 0, while the change in the input values is 2. The average rate of change will be 0 divided by 2, or 0. On the interval from 1 to 3, the change in the output values is 8, while the change in the input values is 2. So the average rate of change is 8 divided by 2, which is 4. For the interval from 3 to 5, the change in output value is 16, while the change in input value is 2. So the average rate of change will be 16 divided by 2, which is 8. Get used to this phrase, consecutive equal length input value intervals. Say it again, consecutive equal length input value intervals. That phrase will show up in many of our justifications. What do you notice about the average rates of change of g of x over consecutive equal length input value intervals? Well, the average rates of change are not constant, but we do see a pattern. The average rate of change increases by 4 each time. One way to say it is that the average rate of change increases at a constant rate. Or we could say the rate of change of the rate of change is constant. 
One more way to say it is that the average rate of change is linear. Let me do a quick side lesson to show you what I mean by this because this concept is going to come up again. When we say the average rate of change is linear, we mean that there's a linear function r of x that gives the average rate of change at x, where x is the first value of each interval. Let's find it. We like to use point slope form to find the equation of a line because we know that all we need is a point and the slope. For the point, we just need to pick an input output pair. We have four to choose from, but let's make our lives easy and include the zero. The output value had to be the average rate of change. The input value, the x value, needed to be the first value of the interval. So we have the point negative one comma zero. What about the slope? In algebra one, we learned that slope is y minus y over x minus x. In pre-calculus, we think of this as the change in output divided by the change in input. In each case, that's four divided by two, which is two. So the slope is two. Now we are ready to write the equation of the line in point slope form, but instead of using y, let's use the function name r of x. So y minus y1 becomes r of x minus zero. And this will equal the slope, which is two. And then x minus x becomes x minus negative one, which is x plus one. Let's rewrite this to get r of x by itself and let's get rid of the parentheses. So uh, we can ignore the zero. So we have r of x is equal to distribute two x plus two. So I claim that this function will give us the average rate of change at every x, where x is the first value of each interval. Let's try it out. Let's see if r at negative three is really negative four. So plugging in negative three, we get two times negative three plus two. Well, that's negative six plus two, which is negative four. Let's try r at negative one. That will be two times negative one plus two. So that's negative two plus two, which is zero. Let's try r at one. That's two times one plus two. That's two plus two, which is four. And let's do r at three. That'll be two times three plus two, which is six plus two, which is eight. This is what we mean when we say that the average rate of change is linear. There is a linear function that will give you the average rate of change for every x value where the x value is the first value of the interval. So we've talked about three ways to describe how a quadratic function behaves over consecutive equal length input value intervals. You need to know all three because all of these will show up on free response questions and multiple choice questions. Example three. Selected values of various functions are given in the tables below. For each table, determine if the function could be linear, quadratic, or neither. Pause the screen and memorize this chart. If f of x is linear, the rate of change will be constant. If f of x is quadratic, then the rate of change of the rate of change will be constant. In other words, the rate of change will be changing at a constant rate. For part A, here are the changes in output, and here are the changes in input. Notice that we do have equal length input value intervals. The rates of change are one, three, and five. In each case, I'm dividing the output 
by the input. We can already see that f of x is not linear because the rate of change is not constant. However, notice that the rate of change is increasing by 2 each time. f of x is quadratic because the average rate of change is increasing at a constant rate over equal length input value intervals. When you are asked to justify your answer, you have to say all of this. For part B, here are the changes in output, and here are the changes in input. Dividing the output change by the input change gives us 1 every time, so the rate of change is constant. G of x is linear because the average rate of change is constant. Notice that for linear, you don't need equal length input value intervals. Part C. Here are the changes in output, and here are the changes in input. Notice that we do have equal length input value intervals. Dividing the change in output value by the change in input value gives us the average rate of change for each interval. We already see that h of x is not linear because the average rate of change is not constant. However, notice that the average rate of change is decreasing at a constant rate. It is going down by one half each time. If we are asked to justify our answer, we will say that h of x is quadratic because the average rate of change is decreasing at a constant rate over equal length input value intervals. In previous videos, we have learned that a function is concave up if the average rate of change is increasing, and a function is concave down if the average rate of change is decreasing. That's this part of this chart that I want you to memorize. So if you have not memorized it, pause the screen and study it right now. Example 4. Selected values of the functions k, m, and p are given in the tables below. For each function, determine if the function could be concave up, concave down, or neither over its domain. For part A, here are the changes in output, and here are the changes in input. We need to determine whether the rate of change is increasing or decreasing, so we can determine if the function is concave up or concave down. If we wanted to calculate the average rate of change for each interval, we would need to divide the change in output by the change in input like this. But this is actually not necessary. Whenever we have equal length input value intervals, we can do a shortcut to figure out if the rate of change is increasing or decreasing. We don't actually need to calculate the average rate of change. If the output values are increasing, the average rate of change is increasing. If the output values are decreasing, then the rate of change is decreasing. This shortcut only works for equal length input value intervals. The change in output value goes from negative 3 to negative 2 to negative 1. These values are increasing. Therefore, the average rate of change is increasing, and the function is concave up. If we had to justify our answer, we would say that k of x is concave up because the average rate of change is increasing over consecutive equal length input value intervals. For part b, we have the same input values as before, so we still have consecutive equal length input value intervals, but this time the output values are increasing by 3 each time. This tells us that the rate of change is constant over consecutive equal length input value intervals. These numbers are not the rate of change. To calculate the actual rate of change, we would have to divide by 0.1. But that doesn't matter. We can see that the uh, rate of change is constant just by looking at the change in output value over equal length input value intervals. If asked to justify our answer, we would say that m of x is linear because the average rate of change is constant over equal length input value intervals. Therefore, m of x is neither concave up nor concave down. For part c, we once again have the same input values as before, but we notice that the change in output is decreasing over these equal length input value intervals. Therefore, 
the rate of change is decreasing. We know that m of x is concave down because the average rate of change is decreasing over consecutive equal length input value intervals. Hey guys, don't forget to like and subscribe, but also if you found this video helpful, there's a lot more where that came from. You can click the upper link, which will take you to the whole unit playlist, or you can click the lower link, which will take you to the next video in the playlist. See you there.